Okay. So, um, why did we organize this talk? Well, um, as uh, academics and scholars wanna be, we were uh, wondering what it means doing research in these uncertain times because we are a generation that lives through constant crisis, and the, pandem the pandemic was just one of the like adding to the other crises, such as the climate crisis, such as the housing crisis, such as the uh, financial crisis. So we are kind of struggling to find our positioning in a world in constant change and a world that we have to interpret and uh, a world that we, in which we want to work for, the, uh, for social justice, for the improve of uh, our social conditions as a community, as scholars, and uh, as, as uh, individuals as well. Um, so uh, the other um, reason is that this is, a kind of, is, is an event uh, that was born actually uh, among uh, some PhDs and we organized some uh, events earlier called Distant Talks because in, still in the pandemic we wanted to uh, have a um, relationship with scholars working on uh, uh, common uh, issues as what we are studying um mostly like social justice and urban justice and um we referred to many uh examples of this uh, double position between scholars and activism and we we've been enrolling in uh, um scholars talking about militant research activist ethnographic methods uh, action research scholar activism and we thought about uh, margarita and carlotta because we have looked through their work and they were really inspiring for um, what we are gonna talk uh, about today. Um, what was, I mean, one of the uh, points that we wanted to talk about with them was trying to understand the boundaries between double positioning. So between scholar activity and militant activity, trying also to understand if these two positionality blurs in a common one, also, we, as, as many of us work on field, we wanted to understand also uh, under our methodological lens, methodological lens how the research is shaped by the field and how this field shapes the research. So also um, wondering how the, uh, our scholars, they have to change themselves while getting on field. And then we also reflect on what it means giving back when we research, because many of us are uh, in many uh, networks, also outside the academia, and we uh, struggle sometimes to uh, bring out what we study inside the, the I mean, the, our uh, PhD and research path. Um, I'm just going to introduce briefly our guests, uh, then I'll, I'll um, I'll let the floor to them. So um, the first is Margherita Grazioli. Uh, Margherita holds a PhD from the University of Leicester and she's actually, she's uh, at the moment a, a postdoc in, the, um, in economic geography in the social unit of the GSSI Institute in L'Aquila. Her work uh, focuses on critical geography, housing struggles and urban social movements. Uh, the second is uh, Carlotta Cacciagli. Uh, she holds a PhD in uh, political science at the Scuola Normale um, uh, Superiore. And she's a, a research fellow at the Politecnico di Milano, working on uh, fragile territories. Correct? Okay, thank you. And um, she focuses on social movements, urban transformations under platform and digital uh, capitalism uh, and social spatial um, inequalities. They both have uh, many publications in international journals, and I'm just going to quote their last latest publications. Uh, Margherita, she published uh, um, Housing, Urban Commons, and the Right to the City in Post-Crisis from Metropolis, the Squatted Cittamiticia, and Carlotta, uh, Housing Movements in Rome, Resistance and Class. So they, bo they both worked in Rome in the last years. Um, I'm, I will stop here and I will uh, let, uh, we'll start with Margherita and I will let her speak. Thank you. So. No. Okay. Okay. 
So, hi everyone. Thanks for having me here today and for the invite. I'm very happy to be here considering that my last in-person conference was in Turin before the lockdown started and so it's very nice to be here once again. Uh, today, as Lorenzo was anticipating, I will talk to you about how to do committed research and how to, uh, let's say, harmonize being an activist with being uh, a researcher. Uh, I would like to uh, say that, first of all, uh, being an activist and a researcher means uh, taking stances about things and not only about the things we research, but about the things that happen also in our work environment. For this reason, I would like to ask before starting my talk to Michele Lancione to say some things about what's happening here in Turin with the Frontex situation. So please, Michele. Thank you very much, Margherita. Margherita is an amazing scholar, friend, and comrade. So. I'm very glad you are here, Margarita. I just want to say that um, it's not um, acceptable for public university to lend its name to an agency like Frontex that is criticized by the European Union itself. So Frontex is a European Union agency at the moment with open proceedings in the European Court of Justice. They are criticizing themselves, and we are not even caring about that. We are signing contracts to do maps for them. We are hiding behind the fact that data is supposedly objective, but we all know data is not objective. It depends on the way you use it, the way you construct it, and what you do about it. So Frontex is cleaning up its name by trying to associate itself with universities that are not supposed to do the kind of job. We should really speak up and be angry about this. Unfortunately, very few are, but I hope that more can be sensitive to the matter. So thank you for this, Margarita. And Thanks thank you for you, giving me the name. This was very important. And Michele also anticipated some things that I will discuss today and that we have also discussed together in the past. So, um, as uh, Lorenzo anticipated, my research is about housing rights movements in Rome. And today I would like to speak to you about my PhD journey, how it started, because it started from there. And now I am based in Rome, I'm still doing research about Rome, but it all started with a PhD in the UK, in the University of Leicester, actually in a department that does not exist anymore, I am sorry to say. And uh, most of the scholars uh, who did critical stuff were made redundant. So just to say that it can be tricky to be an involved scholar, but I think that it makes sense and it's a commitment that should be taken very seriously, both in the field and outside the field. So um, how it started? Um, well, some of, <laughs> some of the people who are in the room used to know me before I started my, my PhD, but um, let's say that I started with a different idea from what I actually did. My idea was to start doing research um, about uh, migrant mobilization uh, uh, in Italy. I started thinking about uh, logistics, uh, anti-racist movements, but made from migrants themselves. But um, the process was uh, of defining my uh, topic was very tricky. And I also have to say very bureaucratized. What you see here in the picture was the handbook that I had, and that was uh, uh, supposed to be the scaffolding of my PhD. So before being authorized to go in the field, we had to present that type uh, of uh, uh, research proposal and also to uh, undergo the so-called research ethics approval. So that was um, a very tricky process because um, let's say that after what happened with Giulio Regeni, I think it's even more difficult now 
because it's been hyper bureaucratized. But the point was that you had to motivate the reason why you wanted to do research, all the potential risks uh, that you could face. Also, if you could pose legal threats to the university. So I, I had a topic in mind, as I said, I changed it uh, through the road, but for sure, the, the first thing I knew was that uh, I wanted to do uh, activist research. So I had to, to negotiate what I had to present to this uh, research ethics approval committee that was not made by social scholars. Uh, actually, it was made by scholars from very different fields. So it was also difficult to explain why I wanted to, to do that. I had to undergo the research ethics approval three times because they kept bouncing back uh, my proposal saying, why well, you want to do this, but you could be involved in illegal facts. If you are involved in demonstrations, you might uh, have confrontations with police and whatnot. And uh, my supervisors that I have to say were very helpful in this matter helped me to navigate the bureaucratic aspect of this, because at the end of the day, what I presented in my uh, PhD dissertation was far more radical than what I said in the first place. And nobody had, had nothing to say about that. It was just a matter of using the right language uh, uh, to get it started, because uh, it was not allowed even to explore, visit the fieldwork before getting these types of approval. I mean, you could do it informally, but you could not put it as a research output. So it was a very tricky bureaucratical process, but it was also useful to think about some of the practical problems that I could face. So it took one full year to write the proposal because uh, our PhD was four years long, we were also teaching, so that's why it was that long. At some point in, at the end of 2014, so a year, almost a year and a half after I started, uh, I got the authorization to go and visit the feedback. And so I did. Uh, so I was still a bit uncertain uh, about what to do. But at, the, at that point, I had an idea about doing something about migrant spotting. So I had two options on the table. The main one was Rome, actually. And uh, Rome was suggested by my supervisors because differently from Bologna was a place where I, where I hadn't lived before because I did my master in Bologna. So they said that also for ethical groundings, it was too tricky to go in a place where I already had all that connections. Actually, I had connections also in Rome because uh, in 2014, there was this uh, national uh, uh, network called Abitare Nella Crisi that gathered um, housing rights movements, groups, unions, and whatnot uh, from all over Italy. Now it doesn't exist anymore, even though there are some attempts at reconvening um, these groups and these movements. But uh, I knew some people in Rome. So, for, so I went to Rome, in November to make my first decision. And, and so I visited Metropolis for uh, the first time. It was actually a very peculiar time also because uh, uh, in the same neighborhood, there had been a, a, a revolt against uh, um, a reception center where some migrants were housed. And it was very close to Metropolis. So it, it was a very also specific time uh, to go. And, and then I went to, to Bologna later to visit the Ex-Telecom, that was a housing spot that now does not exist anymore. It has been replaced actually by a, a very uh, pricey so-called student hotel, just to say, but uh, before there used to be the Ex-Telecom. And then I made my final decision that winter that I would go in Rome and do research there and uh, keep those connections also in Bologna and in other cities to discuss the larger setting of the research. Because uh, of course, as we will see, it does not make sense to isolate uh, your case study or case studies from the overall setting, okay? So even doing case study research does not mean that you isolate it from the context where it is. So um, what was the best way to, um, do research for me. I moved into housing squad 
in Rome. Actually, um, I did what some scholars called extended uh, case study research. So I had the two, uh, two case studies that were uh, related. So they could not, it could not be considered a proper comparative study, even though it had the characteristics of comparison, because uh, the two housing squats that I discussed, uh, as you can see, were uh, kind of close. You can see that from uh, the symbols. Uh, they were inside the same movement, the Bloc Precari Metropolitani, that is a housing rights movement organization that is active uh, in Rome. They had pretty much the same number of families, so they were comparable in that sense. I could compare the internal organization because the number of families were very similar. Also, another characteristic that was peculiar at the time and very similar was that they were uh, the only two housing spots in the time where Roma families would live. And that had uh, a big percentage of Roma families uh, in there, both located in uh, post-industrial neighborhoods. So um, I, did, uh, I decided to do the research in that way. Um, I moved uh, in the one in, uh, in Pietralata uh, for um, a matter of research, actually, because the, in Metropolis, I should have uh, constructed my own house. Uh, yes, I could have uh, done it, of course, but it would have been very complicated, very time consuming. There wasn't a space at the time where I could move. In the other place, that, that was a room that I had to refurbish, uh, uh, I had to paint. It was actually my first way of getting to know people, like asking, oh, would you borrow me something? I need a hammer, I need this, I need that. But it took a month versus maybe six months uh, uh, that I would have spent in Metropolis building a house. So first things first, uh, there was an issue of, of feasibility as well, because uh, my, as I said, uh, my supervisors uh, uh, were uh, very helpful in this matter. I had the opportunity to do uh, one full year of fieldwork without never uh, going back to, to the UK. But as we will see when I hear, it seems a lot. It may be not that much when you have to do that kind of research. So some time was spent getting to know uh, the people uh, letting people know me, I had to go to the assemblies of both the housing spots, present myself, explain my story, explain uh, who I was, what I was going to do, that I was uh, also willing to, to be an activist, not only uh, someone who was observing how they would live. Actually, I have to say that I was very lucky because uh, uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani as a group since its foundation has cooperated a lot uh, with uh, researchers and activist uh, researchers especially. So they were familiar, let's say, with uh, um, that type of activity, especially in Metropolis. In the place where I went to live, they weren't, and this will be important in terms of the data uh, collection that was uh, something that was very, let's say, tricky because um, after let's say getting settled there was a point about uh, activist research in practice because in theory and in the uh, bureaucratic uh, process I showed you of uh, making a proposal everything seems very straightforward okay I will get there I will have a gatekeeper people, people will introduce me then I will start doing uh, interviews I will take pictures I will do this I will do that not that easy to be to be honest uh, just to say uh, after seven years uh, for the first time in the field work I'm still I'm still doing interviews people so just to say that you never have to give for granted what uh, what you do, because uh, activist research, uh, it's, it can be uh, very rewarding, but also very complicated. In my case, I decided to pull uh, from uh, the data collection techniques of ethnography to try uh, and do uh, my work. But as I said, uh, even though, uh, I felt like I had, uh, let's say, some insights already in the field with the people, also knew the activists. It wasn't as easy as I thought. So I had to replan and reschedule what I wanted to do. 
about the practicalities of research here, you can see like the staple equipment uh, that I had for my day-to-day -day research. So notebooks, I used plenty of notebooks, always have one with you and a pen. I was writing a lot. I was working a lot. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, I was walking the distance from the 12 spots that you saw on, uh, on the map. Uh, it was uh, not that much, it was six kilometers, but still, I mean, because I wanted to get to know what's the neighborhoods, the setting, the streets, uh, live the day-to-day -day experience. So I didn't have a car at the time, but even if I had one, I chose to walk, use buses, that kind of stuff. So power bank also with me, always with me, because I was taking pictures with my phone, obviously a decent one, but, and so charging cable, charging station, power bank, everything is like the equipment that was also with me. And also I was my own equipment, my person, my, uh, my personality, my positionality, everything was my equipment uh, um, in this research. Because um, some of these uh, tools could be also very intimidating. I, have, I don't have the chance right now, we can discuss it later if you're interested, um, how these spots are composed, how they were formed, how entrenched they are uh, in the history of Rome. But let's just say that nowadays, uh, housing spots in Rome uh, are, in, uh, are populated mainly by uh, migrants and people who were evicted alike from uh, rented accommodations uh, or that suffered foreclosures and so on. So for instance, the recorder. The recorder can be an extremely intimidating device for people. First of all, migrant people would associate it to police, the police. So uh, it's, a big deal to use the recorder with someone like explaining how uh, your um, how the, the recorded material will be used, where it will be stored, and you can explain it on, let's say, even a bureaucratic level. Uh, one thing that we had to uh, attach to our um, ethics application was uh, the informed consent form, uh, which is uh, this handout that you should give to every interviewee. To be honest, I think I maybe used it twice, maybe not even twice. I cannot remember, but uh, not more than twice. Because in these kind of spaces, thank you, consent is not a formal matter, is a point of relational ethics and is also a point of collective consent. So I was mentioning before that I went to the assemblies to explain how I was, what I was doing, what kind of research and whatnot. Still, it was very difficult in the first place to uh, get people to be interviewed with the, with the recorder. That was also important for me because some conversations were ex maybe extreme, uh, extremely long. But I could remember people like freezing in front of the recorder, people that usually would be extremely talkative, like speaking a lot and then freezing in front of the recorder. Sometimes it was just a matter of putting it under a basket, uh, like obviously with the person's consent and say, look, don't look at the, the recorder, look at me. Sometimes I had just to put it away because it would have jeopardized the whole interview. So I had to take notes, notes and notes. This was just an example, but it was very important. And also, uh, Michele could say uh, even more about this, uh, using vi uh, visual materials, even trickier, how you take pictures, how, what, uh, what, you do, uh, what you do with those pictures, what is the subject, not the object, the subject of your image, what you're doing. Uh, it's not moving forward. Hmm. At the, in the beginning of my research, uh, I used to take pictures of uh, spaces. I chose in the beginning not to take pictures of uh, people, actually, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, um, even now, uh, the majority of my interviews uh, are anonymous just for the reason why that uh, um, 
people should feel free to see to say whatever they want. Uh, obviously, uh, they are recognizable. This is a problem that can never be fully solved in an in a setting like that. But at least people uh, maybe uh, let's say may feel uh, safer to be anonymous, and also for a matter of not being again recognized by police, not having their legal status jeopardized because squatting is illegal in Italy. So that was the first reason I chose not to, uh, let's say, write uh, uh, full names unless they said uh, that I could do so. And to leave to them the choice in other types of situations to go public, meaning demonstrations, interviews, movies, uh, other type of material. In this case, I, I chose to go for um, a different path. It was also uh, useful for me because uh, the fact that I was uh, an activist at some point was an advantage, but also it could, uh, uh, let's say, bounce back because people would be like, oh, but will you uh, give my recording or my interview to other people? Will you discuss what I'm saying with the other activists? Uh, will you... Uh, discuss what I said in the assembly and I would say no, no, no. But again, it was not a matter of giving them uh, the informed consent form saying I want this, this and that. It was a matter of relational ethics, uh, as I said. So this is a point that I think should be taken in great consideration and also the respect for, uh, for people. Because uh, in the kind of research I'm doing, there is a process of homemaking at stake from different perspectives. And uh, uh, going in someone's house, uh, like uh, uh, letting them show you how they exactly build their houses from scratch, also explaining to you how, why they squatted, where they came from. And sometimes, I mean, they are all uh, very... Uh, complicated stories. You have Roma families that used to live in a ditch uh, uh, before the military airport of Centocelle, to people coming from uh, uh, migrant reception centers, people that, was, that were also used to be middle class that found themselves homeless with the crisis, that even used to have their own small shops and businesses and ended up like that in a situation that they did not expect. So uh, it may seem impersonal to take pictures of spaces, but actually it's not. It tells uh, a lot about people. And then as much as you get familiarity, I mean, that is also a matter of uh, living with people, uh, experiences they, experiencing day-to-day -day routines and also sociabilities. In the picture in the middle, you could see these uh, um, Cucina Meticcia, Mestizo Cookery Tournament that we did in Metropolis last summer. Everyone cooked uh, something from their own country or what they wanted, and there were prizes. So it was a very nice uh, uh, situation because cooking, for instance, in these spaces is very important. So this, was, this is also another important aspect. If you want to be uh, at least, let's say, um, participating uh, in a, in a research setting, even not being an activist, you need to be uh, involved in the everyday of people and care about that. Care is really important. Uh, let's see if it, it's a bit slow. I hope it will. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, there is also a, a lot of direct action at stake. Um, of course, you can you can see here some images. One is from uh, a recent uh, demonstration. Another one was uh, during the eviction of one of the largest uh, housing squats uh, in Rome, Piazza Indipendenza, during uh, 2017. Here, the um, vaccination campaign inside one of the housing squats that was done last summer. Uh, you have to take uh, into account that uh, people who had uh, no visas or, or uh, without uh, a legally registered address could not get vaccinated at the beginning of uh, the vaccination campaign. And we managed uh, to get the healthcare agency, the ASL, to uh, provide for in-house uh, vaccination. It was a very important uh, moment. So there are many different types of actions that you can undertake and that will also uh, affect the research output uh, that you will uh, uh, give out there, because I think that's another important matter 
what it, what it means to let's say, not even publish what is the research output I want. I will um, I will say that in some cases uh, I haven't figured out myself yet uh, how to produce a research output, and here my activist positionality helped me also to stop and think that maybe it was not the case to throw those data out there uh, without being sure what to do with it, because I could have done more damage than good. And I wanted to bring an example that I discussed with uh, Lorenz at length, actually, that is the one of the ex-penicillina Leo. Uh, this used to be the biggest penicillin factor, uh, factory in Italy. It was inaugurated by Alexander Fleming, the inventor himself of penicillin in uh, uh, 1951. It was abandoned in early uh, 2000 and it became a gigantic uh, dump of uh, uh, asbestos, uh, uh, medical, uh, uh, you can say, uh, supplies and equipment were left uh, uh, in the place. So this is the reason why it is so degraded. It has not been abandoned one century ago, but uh, as you can see, it's in that state. And after a string of evictions in the Tiburtina area, starting from uh, the first <laughs> Baobab, actually, uh, the place uh, was uh, crowded by people uh, who were not in any, uh, let's say, politically organized path that didn't know where to go and moved uh, in this place. I went there, sometimes it was very difficult to go uh, in that place. Uh, it was uh, uh, later evicted, uh, even with uh, uh, the presence of the then Minister of Interior, uh, Matteo, Matteo Salvini. The point was that I didn't know what to do with the data, because yes, I talked to people, but not that many. Uh, people were uh, going back and forth. Uh, speaking about that place at the time would have meant uh, uncovering the safe routes they had in and out, uh, what was happening in there. So. I decided that maybe using that data in that moment would have not been appropriate. As I said, I would have done probably more damage than good. Uh, I would have even disclosed the sensitive information that I didn't want to disclose at the time. Now I'm thinking about writing something about that place because now they're speaking about a big urban regeneration process. Uh, project in this in this place they want to do the the, the 2030 uh, expo from in this place which is absolutely I mean um, ridicule but the point is that now it would it can make sense to story size what happened but at the time uh, my activist uh, research ethics helped me to say no stop this data stay with you and maybe later you might want to use them. I would want to uh, close this presentation by discussing then the problem of output. Let's say that when you are an activist research, you always feel like your uh, data and research output is obsolete uh, in the moment it's out, because uh, everyone who has done this knows that um, reality moves way uh, quicker than, than you. So let's say that what you publish, whatever type of output it is, it is just a provisional, uh, let's say, snapshot of what's the reality in the moment where you decided to close the project. So first of all, uh, especially when you are involved in a research setting, there should be a moment when you say, I close this. This is the moment where I don't put any other data uh, in the, uh, in, in my work, otherwise it will be too confused. You can rework it, you can continuously rework it. Part of my PhD dissertation was reworked and it became a book that is now being uh, also translated in Italian and that will be uh, published uh, uh, in a couple months. And when I published this book, for instance, it, uh, I had a lot of debates with my comrades and also with the inhabitants of Metropolis because I was saying, yeah, but we are published, I mean, I'm publishing uh, the story of Metropolis with uh, um, an academic uh, publishing comp company. It's in English, uh, uh, the price uh, of the book, uh, uh, it's a problem also. So uh, it won't be read by the, the majority of our uh, activist court and by the people who are in Metropolis. 
The idea was that um, disseminating the knowledge about metropolis was the good uh, was a, a a good idea, nevertheless, that we would present the book in metropolis uh, uh, with others and then to translate it. This was uh, uh, another idea. So uh, let's make the case known also elsewhere uh, to help us with other processes. And, uh, and then we translate it and we make it more accessible for everyone. But it was a choice that I discussed with my comrades and still I'm not <laughs> that convinced uh, about that 100%, but uh, this is some compromise that you have to make. Um, yeah, it's not moving. Okay, maybe. Okay, let's this. Okay, so, and other two ways where you can put your, uh, let's say, knowledge production at service uh, of uh, uh, the activist experiences you are part of. Uh, for instance, in Metropolis, we recently organized a national conference called Abitare 2021, uh, where we gathered uh, groups, uh, uh, academics, uh, uh, activist researchers, and many people from, uh, uh, from different parts of Italy to discuss issues connected with uh, uh, the current housing crisis, uh, so the issue of uh, the lack of public housing, touristification, financialization. It lasted two days. It was very interesting. And the final purpose was uh, to help uh, proposing new policy solutions from below. So another thing that you could do that uh, is not uh, necessarily part of academic dissemination is, again, going public and also helping doing this kind of work. So now we are trying to write a new comprehensive law proposal for reforming uh, housing policies, and we are also writing an international application for uh, proposing uh, uh, metropolis uh, uh, to the to UNESCO as uh, um, heritage of humanity. So this is another way where you can put, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some type of language and some kinds of skill at service uh, of the cause. So I think I spoke even too much, but. Thank you for your attention and yes, that was it. Thank you, Margarita. It was really inspiring your talk. So I'll move quickly to Carlotta's presentation. Should I? Should I switch something to the few other? Let's say this. Okay. 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 I will uh, take uh, ten or uh, well twelve minutes to present uh, to present because a lot of things have been already said by Margarita. I wish to thank all of you for organizing uh, this talk, but also for. Uh, uh, reflecting upon uh, the issue of uh, the involvement uh, as researcher in the political field and uh, the other way around. Uh, instead of talking about uh, the militant research uh, as Margarita did, uh, I try to uh, reflect with you uh, on another point that is uh, how political activism can shape uh, the content of the research. That is in a kind of sense, the other pattern. Uh, because indeed uh, we can identify, uh, well, I will not base this presentation on my personal research uh, in Rome, uh, but because it's uh, uh, a sort of parenthesis, because I'm not uh, working uh, on housing movements, uh, but I work on uh, the structural feature of urban space uh, under late capitalism. So I'm not uh, focused on the agency of movements, but I'm focused on uh, analyzing the structural feature that uh, 
uh, that structure inequalities and allow capitalism uh, to reproduce in time and space. We can say that, uh, uh, okay, in uh, reflecting upon the issue of uh, uh, the involvement uh, in the research field, uh, we can identify two main approach, two main uh, type of relationship between uh, social research and political activism. Uh, one, uh, one way to think about this, re this relationship uh, uh, is uh, to carry out uh, a sort of militant research. That is uh, uh, what Margherita um, discussed above, in which mainly uh, the object of the research is also the platform in which uh, the researcher participates. Okay? So this is a way in which the researcher for a lapse of time or for a life is also the activist, an activist of a movement. And this is one, one type of relationship, one type of relationship between the field and the researcher, between the activist and the, and the researcher. The other um, approach to the field is when you, as a researcher, put your competencies and knowledge for other type of struggles, okay? This is an example, for example, if I'm uh, an economist that studies uh, minimum uh, wave, wage, I can also be an activist in the working struggles and I can put my knowledge and my competencies as an economist uh, and make them available for uh, other type of struggles, okay? This does not mean that the object of the research is the same, but is related to the struggle you are part of, okay? In this type of, in this uh, model, activist is not the researcher, but uh, the researcher carry out uh, a research that uh, make available for uh, the platform uh, is part of. And the example of an economist is, uh, is uh, important because uh, every type of struggles, social struggles need to understand how economy works uh, to uh, claim different uh, uh, and also to develop other model uh, of production development and uh, workspace. So I will try to say something about this second, uh, this second type of relationship. However, we have these two approaches, but also two different patterns uh, uh, to which this link uh, um, is in, through which uh, the relationship uh, uh, occur. We can start, for example, uh, uh, from a social research and uh, uh, develop a political activism. So social research in a kind of sense uh, uh, shape uh, the political activism, but is also um, true the other way around. That means uh, when political activism shape uh, the social research is a double process that always happens. In particular, uh, um, in this, in this second pattern that drove political activism to social research uh, is important because uh, the context of the struggle you are part of uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this pattern suggests you what could be relevant to be studied, okay? Uh, that means that your militant position, your position as activist, open up you new analytical perspective to inquire at a theoretical level. It means that inputs and insights for what could be interesting for a sociological point of view is suggested to you by what you do as an activist, okay? And I will provide some example about that. For example, in my personal experience, um, my research field is related to the urban studies. So I can be considered, um, well, even if I'm not a sociologist, I'm a philosopher, but uh, I study uh, uh, in the field of urban studies. I, I, I have always been focused on metropolis, on uh, uh, big city, on the um, urban scale. But as my life as an activist is not uh, focused on city, but it's focused on rural, peri-urban and pro provincial context. Because I'm living in Tuscany, uh, in a small village that is not so small, but uh, that is called Empoli, that is in between uh, Florence and Pisa. 
so I, my, my activism develops between Empoli and Firenze. So in a context, in a context that is not the one of the uh, urban uh, space, okay? By leading on my, my activism, I realize a lot of limits that the urban approach have, okay? Because in particular, uh, I realize that speaking about urban, we uh, risk to develop a sort of colonialistic uh, way of approaching the territories, okay? Because Italy is not made by big cities, first of all. Second, uh, the production in a post fordist model is not based on city. So uh, focusing, uh, and we, mm, we tend to analyze what, uh, what is not urban as not urban, okay? So we tend to define by a negative perspective what is not a city. And I realize just uh, um, contracting my activism in my, in my cities that uh, urban studies risk to develop a colonialistic uh, perspective. In particular, because uh, um, if we focus on peripheral and rural areas, we realize that uh, the sharpest conflict of our age are based mainly on these territories, okay? Of course, we can find gentrification, touristification, and other way, uh, and many other things in uh, urban context, but, uh, uh, and this is also a political, uh, a political issue, the main things related to production in post for this era are not based in urban scale, on urban space, are based in other type of space that need to be analyzed and that uh, sociological uh, studies are not much more focused on, okay? In particular, uh, the conflicts around class and struggles need to be analyzed also by assuming a not urban perspective, a perspective, but a rural and uh, um, peri-urban one. I will just uh, provide you uh, three examples that I'm sure you are, uh, you know, at least a little bit, uh, that are uh, the, the most important one uh, is the GKN struggles. GKN is uh, a, com a drive line, uh, GKN drive line is an automotive uh, multinational uh, owned by Edge Found uh, that the 9th of July uh, filed uh, 500 workers because of the localization, okay? Of course, uh, um, many solidarity groups, uh, political uh, groups, uh, and also citizens constructed uh, uh, a solidarity group, uh, which is called Insurgiamo, that started also a campaign. Uh, and of course, I do not have time to unpack uh, uh, what happens in GKPN, what we are organizing and so on and so forth. But what I, I, I would like to, uh, uh, to remind uh, uh, to you and to all of us is that uh, if you remember, the mainstream uh, narrative is that, uh, okay, we are in a post-industrial era, production is not uh, crucial anymore. Uh, uh, the workers and the working struggle are not the crucial, uh, uh, the crucial point of our contemporaneity. But uh, if we look at this small town uh, that is Florence, but GKPN is not even in Florence, it's in Campi Bisenzio, we realize immediately that uh, working class uh, exists uh, and also production related to, to, to existing uh, class uh, is still crucial in our uh, contemporary economies. Uh, and also that the protagonism of the working, uh, or working class people uh, uh, is still at the core of our collective action. The, another example is the text print, okay, uh, in Prato, that is another, uh, well, more or less small town near Florence, in which uh, we, we can find the Pakistani workers that are fighting for many years indeed for the working condition. This is a Prato is a, a, a small town, but a leading sector uh, in the, for manufacturing district. So uh, here uh, we can witness a high repression, but a long lasting struggle by these, uh, uh, living on by these uh, workers. 
that uh, also recalled uh, many um, solidarity initiatives in this, uh, uh, in this district that is not uh, an urban one. Uh, the third example, uh, I don't know if you know about this case, that is uh, the investigation KEU, that is uh, indeed we are uh, this evening I will have a call uh, on with uh, the arena. Uh, I don't know if you know the uh, program of Giletti that uh, yeah. called us many times. We are always on the national television because of this, because uh, uh, here we are in Empoli, in my town. Um, I don't know if you know what is uh, Santa Croce and the Distretto del Cuoio. That is a district uh, in between Florence and Pisa that is the leading sector, a billionaire industry for the leather processing, okay? Here uh, in April, we realized because of the investigation that uh, the toxic waste of this industry have been used uh, to construct a street, the, the street that drove from Empoli to Siena, okay? And we have uh, um, Eugenio Gianni, the president of the Toscana region and the uh, capo di gabinetto, I don't know what's the translation, uh, inquired and uh, a lot of things. And this, this um, very productive area uh, is also an area uh, that uh, has not all, well, in which uh, we say, okay, we cannot find mobilization, we cannot find movements, but uh, since that moment, uh, we constructed a so-called uh, permanent ass assembly in Okeu, in which we try to link uh, the voice of the condition of production and the environmental struggles, okay? Saying that uh, the same model of production is, the, uh, is based on the exploitation of workers and uh, of environment at the same time. And this is another important example that uh, um, that show uh, that sh show how it's not true that we need to focus uh, on what happens in city to understand the sharpest conflict of uh, of our time. And I I discuss with you these three examples just to let you know that before uh, uh, starting this mobilization uh, that are. Uh, well, recent, we can say, even if uh, G, uh, JK, GKPN um, organized through uh, the Collettivo di Fabrica since a long time, I realized, uh, because of my uh, political participation in this uh, platform, that maybe my approach uh, to the space uh, should be not so update. I don't know how can I say, it's, uh, it's the political activity that I did uh, like uh, an activist uh, that opens up to me new possibility also for a theoretical level, okay? So it's because I was part uh, of this platform that I started to reflect uh, upon, upon different perspectives to which we can approach the space. And I realized that uh, I assumed a sort of colonialistic approach and uh, at the same time, I start and I decide to um, concentrate on my study on different aspects that are not related on city scale. Okay, so in this kind of sense, not just uh, um, our research condition the uh, the field, but also the field set the agenda. How can I say? <laughs> uh, set the agenda of our studies, and this is another way to think about uh, the relationship between research and field. And uh, I can stop here because I think that, uh, thank you very much. Okay. So, okay, thank you a lot for your recording talk as well. It was so interesting to see 
by the other perspective. So yeah, as you were, as you, as you were, were explaining. So I'll, I have many reflections, but I'll first ask who's here and who's online. Uh, if you have some questions or uh, suggestions, or uh, if you want to open a discussion uh, on some points, you just you can just open your mic and yeah, just talk. And if you want to uh, turn on your camera as well, uh, we have the Zoom call projected in a screen, so we can see you actually. And I might turn the webcam so you like we can all yeah. <laughs> we can look at each other in a kind of way. Well, if, if nobody is going to go, I, I might have a, a quick one um, for both um, uh, Margarita and Carlotta, who, who I thank. I mean, it was a, it was a really um, inspiring, but also straightforward um, talk. So it was really very much appreciated. And I was wondering um, if there were times, I mean, in a way, you've already uh, said this. I mean, or kind of mentioned it, uh, but I was wondering if there were times in which you felt that you were too involved in the sense, I mean, I guess, uh, I guess it must have happened, but if you could kind of elaborate a bit more on that and um, if like there were times that you felt like, oh, uh, I'm jumping to conclusions because I'm, I'm kind of, you know, the, I really feel for these causes and yeah, I mean, as I said, you, you've said this, but I'd just like to hear more from you because it's something that I, I kind of relate to and yeah, thanks. So maybe we can get all the questions if there are and then our guests will reply. To, to those also who's here we have anyone? we may um i have um well uh, first of all um i was really interested in your uh with your uh, presentation um for my case for example i'm actually uh in that second phase in education so um I used to be uh, an activist, but also a researcher. And um, well, my research start from a youth activism, um, activity, but then turn uh, in a just research activity. And I also am an activist outside the academia uh, in other fields. So I'm trying to, as you said, uh, some struggles uh, with my. Um, but um, sometimes it happens to me to uh, have a confrontation uh, with people uh, outside the academia, but also inside sometimes, that um, has have a kind of difficulty to understand how uh, um, position uh, research can be um, compatible. Yeah, not just compatible, but also um, how can we, uh, you know, with this, this kind of idea that the research is kind of objective, uh, something that uh, is just like that, you know, you have the data, so um, the research used to be uh, something that um, is demonstrated, so um, being political, uh, political activist uh, is something that uh, for some people um, uh, is um, make your research less uh, uh, relevant, less uh, in some way important because uh, you have this 
uh, you know, political conditions that uh, make the research uh, not so true, not so uh, believable. So, um, how, in your perspective, from in your experience, uh, you can also just talk with these kind of people uh, and try to make them understand that what you do and the, the relevance. Other questions? Uh, we can start the time to go. I'll, I'll turn the camera again. Well, indeed, they are it seems to be related to the questions. And uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, these are a delicate issue uh, that deserve to be explained uh, in, uh, for example, in writing the thesis. In, uh, Methodological chapter in which you take into account the ethical implication, uh, even if uh, the Italian university don't ask uh, what Margherita, uh, because it, it, in my case, uh, they told me, okay, you can, you can go and uh, let's see what happens, so nobody cares about. <laughs> so, this is another the extreme poll uh, that say, okay, it's uh, a little bit problematic because you are a researcher that is working for our university and uh, you are. Uh, we need to work on the today, okay, but uh, it's, uh, it's a little bizarre. Um, I, I understand your uh, your uh, concern because it was also mine, but uh, I think we, we need to have clear in mind and accept ourselves that uh, there is a positivistic model of approaching science, that is one option. And the other option is what Bura uh, was, for example, called the reflective model of science in which you based uh, your analysis on your personal commitment in the field. That does not mean that uh, uh, you cannot fail, that you can have the objective vision, but it means that you, uh, you put at the core your personal uh, ideas that are also susceptible to be shaped by the field. And what is helpful, and has been helpful for me, is to divide two concepts, the one of interpretation and the one of analysis that could be related, but they are not the same thing. Interpretation can be uh, linked to your personal uh, uh, feeling, uh, to your personal uh, um, mood, uh, for example, because we, cannot just, we are not interpreting the same uh, thing at the same uh, moment in the same way. But analysis uh, needs to be a process based uh, on uh, rationality in some sense. And I think, and this, this is for me very helpful to try to ask myself, and this is also to uh, reply to the question, uh, what is helpful for me is to um, ask myself if I'm analyzing or interpreting or a mix of uh, the both, or if I'm just uh, project, uh, making a project projection of uh, what I think on the object of study. That is another way to colonize the object. So try to um, sit down a moment and understand what we are doing. That does not mean that we need to stop to do that, but just to uh, try to distinguish between the different processes. That's uh, uh, a thing that we can do. OK, um, these two questions are actually crucial, uh, I believe. Um, and I will start uh, from uh, the first one, but because I think it relates a lot uh, uh, also to the second one. So I have to say that in my case, uh, at some point, um, I stopped asking myself the question whether I was too involved, because by definition, I, I was just involved. So there is not, I mean, are being inside or being uh, out. I mean, or, either you're inside or you're out. So there's no, uh, uh, it's difficult to find a third way um, in that. Uh, so uh, I have to say that for me, uh, an issue where uh, I asked myself uh, about my involvement and how to, um, in, if my positionality was a problem, was not about uh, involvement itself, but as I said about my positionality of both an activist and a researcher, because people, uh, would talk to me often more as an activist than uh, 
as a, as a researcher and or the other way around. So in the beginning, for instance, people who are not that familiar with me um, would feel like they had to give me like, how can they say, um, formal replies in a way, like uh, responding with uh, a Polish language, try and speak perfect Italian, stuff like that. And I was like, no, I mean, talk to me as if, you know, as if we were having like a normal conversation, which is kind of absurd in terms sometimes because you are in front of a person, again, with a recorder, a notebook, so there's obviously a non-horizontal, uh, let's say, uh, positioning uh, in that uh, in that moment, and uh, um, or uh, the opposite process where uh, you need, let's say, also the the recorder again because you need to make a transcript of the interview because you, you want to try and let's say um, collect not a fully coherent because it would be impossible, but let's say a, a narrative of the story of the person. And many times people that know you, so I mean that have talked to you many, many times would give, uh, uh, let's say, a lot of the background for, for uh, let's say, uh, for granted. They would not start from the beginning or they would open one million uh, uh, parentheses and divert the conversation in many uh, different directions. So you will have like recordings of two hours that are a hot mess uh, to transcribe. And so that would be another problem. Like, how can I? shape something like uh, that is clear with that and for instance i had this problem also with uh, translation i was discussing this uh, uh, with michele before we came here because it's very difficult to translate that kind of conversation and often with migrant people in english because they didn't want to uh, let's say colonize the language but i was doing it by definition because i was uh, uh, translating the jargon, the language, the emotion of someone who is uh, not even uh, mother tongue Italian, uh, into Italian in a way, and then in English. So, uh, and these are co some contradictions that sometimes are uh, impossible to solve. As uh, uh, Carlotta was saying, you need to uh, discuss them at length uh, in uh, your methodology and put it also uh, leave it for an open discussion with other researchers that can might find other way to answer this problem is which comes down to the other uh, question that that you asked um, because my uh, methodology chapter for instance will focus exactly on these two points the practicalities of research but also the pre uh, the introduction to the methodological pro uh, chapter was about this issue because there is a big misunderstanding i think between uh, uh, that is the conflation between uh, being objective and being neutral these are not the same things being able of giving a rigorous perspective about something doesn't mean you, you, are, you are neutral actually that's um, uh, this, and this is something that especially in anthropology has been discussed uh, in a more developed way at least uh, since uh, the 90s I uh, uh, for instance, Nancy Sheffer Hughes uh, started uh, this conversation, but uh, there are many authors who did that in a very nice way. Because it's, uh, there's no reason why a social scientist, uh, as any other person in a society, may feel exempted from taking a stance uh, when uh, uh, social injustice happens, especially before they arrive. That's exactly the point you are there. And thinking, uh, and thinking that you're just there to observe is something that has nothing to do with objectiveness. What you can do though, uh, to also debunk this myth of the qualitative researcher or the uh, committed researcher being, um, uh, let's say, uh, not as rigorous as the others, is focusing a lot, I think, on, on the context. Because uh, I think that you are uh, liable to criticize on this point when you're still speaking. Meaning, ah, yes, yes, I have a nice, uh, Hey, Sadio, it's not about that and I will isolate it from the world. I want to discuss where it comes from, where it started. Uh, if you don't offer a setting, there you are not being taught as rigorous as you should. So, for instance, in my work, I did a lot of yes, but a big part of my work was doing archive research, studying documents, uh, the secondary analysis, a lot of this stuff. And I think this is very uh, important and uh, also makes you. 
uh, not examined because there is an ideological bias about that that is not completely overcome. But at least you can see here my work digital, I was engaged in the field, but I'm not blamed. And it, what I'm doing is serious, and there is grounds for it to see what I need. So, Uh, I go for a round of questions. Um, yeah. Maybe you want to get a little bit closer because I don't know if the mic gets there. So, yes, then the question is that yes, you spoke a lot about the research for this commitments uh, and stuff. I think that within the academy, I think we, we, we are a lot in the time. But I think in the, at the same time, as activists, we are, we are a lot to learn from the academy. I mean, um, is, I think we can really do the, this very Italian um, way of approach is a uh, way to be at the same time an activist and a researcher. The common, the common uh, background of the Cerca, but I don't know what it is. But the question is different. Um, we have a lot to learn as activists, most of all, because of this kind of research. I think, yes, of course, um, the academy is important to study uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, this research and so on, but uh, in the recognition, um, what's your families, what your friends, and what they learn from, from your um, research, and what do you think we can learn from this research, uh, or to put it differently, uh, during, the, during the research, um, uh, where there are moments in which you thought. Uh, I should go in, I should um, come with this set to say then something about what I discovered in this sort of uh, um, work of research. So, no, no, I think I would see yeah. the very point is this. I think that as activists, we, we have a lot to learn from this because many times I got the question work. Um, there was a very gap. Was the reality, the very reality about the So I think that, that we, are sort of, we are reaching to that between the academy and the, and the social, but as well between groups, collectives, artists, and the movement, and the movement which they are engaged, which they are, uh, to which they are uh, wanting to perform. Yeah, actually, it's funny because I discussed this uh, very issue of, with my comrades yesterday because I told them that I was coming here and so we had uh, a chat exactly about this point. To be honest, I don't think I have uh, taught anything to my comrades because I, uh, actually I've learned a lot. I cannot say I've taught something, but Discussing about the benefits of research for uh, activist environments, uh, for instance, the one that I'm part of, I would say, uh, we discussed yesterday that uh, the greatest benefit probably is the systematizing things because direct action is very fast, it has to go with contingencies. So we write lots of stuff, collect lots, uh, lots of information that many times are not systematized, do not put them uh, in a coherent uh, shape because you have to follow what's happening. So you write, uh, for instance, uh, a document with the latest data about addiction, but do not maybe as uh, many times compare it with the data from uh, the same leaf that you uh, did like 10 years ago. I'm just doing a specific example, but just to say that I think the greatest benefit is uh, uh, having the space to systematize. Many times it's useful for that reason, so we can uh, collect materials that come from uh, uh, a longer time span, and then you can say, oh, uh, 
this is what we did and uh, try and collect this information for different purposes. So I think that it's probably the, the greatest uh, advantage, maybe. I don't know if also Carlotta wants to add something about like this. Maybe that's a question. Yeah, yeah. Francesca, you can turn on your mic and talk. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for your uh, for your presentation. Uh, this is just actually, it's not really a question. Is um, when you're done, well, when you go back and you have to sit down and write your thesis when it comes to the PhD thesis and everything. Uh, in cases like these, there's a really a high involvement, a very strong involvement with your research and what you're doing. Uh, I would like to like know a little bit more uh, about the experience of going back. And I think, uh, I don't know uh, if you, I, I don't think you're, you're stayed in the place you have done your field work, but you've, you've gone back somewhere else. Uh, and uh, well, it's, uh, the time passes, uh, and what what has happened uh, is uh, far and far away in a certain in a in a sense. But also, is that like I think uh, it must be dif difficult to kind of stop that experience uh, in a sense uh, and just sit down and write write about everything. That's my that, this is my question. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard. <laughs> always writing is hard. And uh, as Margherita told in the, in the talk, uh, at one point you need to decide that uh, it's done. You stop collecting the materials, but uh, um, of course it's true that uh, you cannot stop living and developing your ideas. So it means that, uh, for example, in my case, when I came back to the field, I, I was living in Rome and I came back in Florence uh, and uh, I start writing uh, the, the thesis. Uh, once I stopped writing, uh, I developed another ideas as a militant, uh, as a researcher, and I love to uh, change everything uh, I had written before. So, uh, for example, if I um, read now my thesis, uh, I, my evaluation uh, as, uh, are completely different, okay? In a kind of sense, uh, you need to um, accept that uh, even if you talk about the process, uh, you are, however, uh, giving back a photography. So it's not just a photography of the movement you are analyzing, not just a, a photography of the, a picture of, um, of a reality, but you are also providing a picture of what, uh, what is your interpretation in that moment. I think now different things. And if I, if I start again, I, I will provide different conclusion and, uh, and different interpretation, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's good like that. I mean, uh, we, we need also to think about research not as a, an individual uh, process, but as a collective one. I mean that, uh, we can put a piece in an overall picture and another researcher after me will uh, read maybe my things and develop an opposite vision that's also based on my piece of knowledge that I had, okay? So I think that the only way is to, um, is to think about research as a collective, not just in terms of horizontality, but also in terms of timing, okay? We are contributing to a, to a development uh, of knowledge. So if we think like that, we can accept that uh, uh, data can be obsolete and we can uh, also hang end of the difficulties of the writing process. Yeah, I very much agree with Carlotta. I have to say that uh, in my case, I did not exactly go back to where I was based in the beginning. I mean, that was the idea, but actually, um, I let's say commuted a lot between Rome and the UK and basically went to Leicester only when I had to teach. Uh, that was not the plan in the beginning. So I wrote most of my thesis while being uh, in Rome, to be honest. And, but I had to follow the exact same process that Carlotta described. At some point uh, you have to 
to stop. And uh, again, as I said, that that's just a snapshot uh, of uh, that specific uh, time span you're following and where you are involved. And that's also I meaning the nature of uh, uh, reality and also in uh, the, in the, I mean, it's part of the activist experience as well. I mean, many things that we do uh, tactically and strategically may be obsolete uh, the day after you did them. So uh, at the same, uh, so you cannot, uh, it's impossible to think that your research might be like, um, persistent uh, in time more than uh, the setting uh, where it's based. <laughs> so uh, it's difficult and uh, um, would like to put on the table also the fact that this, uh, uh, and this is something that also you might want to consider uh, um, when uh, uh, publishing in the future also in journals. Sometimes you may also feel a bit frustrated because uh, especially when you're talking about very uh, lively material, uh, the reviewing and publishing process can be uh, extremely uh, slow compared to what you did. So you might feel you might feel you're publishing something that is not just a bit uh, outdated that you might want to change, but that is actually uh, obsolete. Uh, to be honest, I am still living with that kind of frustration at times. It cannot be uh, fully solved because. Uh, uh, publishing in academic journals and even, I mean, sometimes it's uh, bigger to publish a book than uh, an article uh, in a journal. That's part of the game and you need to um, like strategize how you want to uh, discuss your, your content and what you want to put uh, uh, on the table there because uh, yeah, otherwise, and, and you will uh, feel like you have to stop and write many, many times. And uh, uh, I, I was mentioning this because, of course, the, the dissertation will be uh, very important, the thesis for you to write and whatnot, but also publishing articles will be very important for you, and you need to be aware even of this aspect uh, of writing. And also the fact that you cannot go crazy trying to update every time the article, once a review comes back, you say, okay, I will rewrite the whole article. Don't do that. <laughs> it will drive you crazy. So accept exactly the uh, temporality of your work when publishing in journal exactly as you could do with the thesis. This is like a, a very heartfelt uh, suggestion, if I may, even if not requested, because otherwise it's very difficult to cope uh, with, the, with the requirements. I mean, Michele could uh, save you a lot, but he's also an editor and then so much material published. So, yeah. I can only say that. There is, there is this whole disjunction between uh, the time period and the time of publishing. Yeah, so, Get it. Yeah. Sorry, I just asked if you want oh, to yeah, get yeah. closer to so, those, otherwise they can't hear you on the mic. Yeah, sorry. So the disjunction that Margarita is, is talking about is a temporal one, but it's also an emotional one because because you are so much invested when you build work on 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 the people you meet and you're explaining so well today, and so you want to give something back, you want to be involved, and you want to be there, and you want to get you know into the politics of place. And academia is not designed for that. Your own, your own career is not designed to do that. And so, you know, one thing that you, maybe, maybe I just, uh, I also asked a question since uh, you invited me to go. Um, one thing that you didn't, you didn't um, unpack, uh, and maybe this is an opportunity to do so because I know I'm sure there are a lot of people saying, but I know that you keep my is back, is around having different strategies of publication. So I'm talking about writing. I am not talking about the rest of the book you explained already. Different strategies of publication using different kinds of media and different kinds of audiences in order to articulate some of the political message and also in order to let that emotional capacity that you are creating time to, in a sense, to discharge that, you know, because that is also important. So, time you write a, a piece on the blog just because you are very angry or something. And you do that not only because you want to communicate to your audience, but also because you need to do that. It's like a, it's like a body healing. 
And if instead of doing a blog piece, you would do a paper for Travis and geography, it would take 18 months to get the first round of review. <laughs> so I, I just want to hear maybe more from you on this point because I know I know Margarita that you are doing many different kinds of writings. So you know, on Metropolis, that, that has been a book recently, a collected book, two part of, and, and so what is the role of this writing that is not necessarily recognized in academia, but is still very important for, for scholarship and for Grazie, Michele. Actually, knowing uh, uh, also uh, Carlotta's work, I, I, I would like to leave it to her first because uh, she has, uh, I think she has a more diversified, uh, let's say, writing strategy than me. I mean, you, you write even on different uh, platforms and speaking about and writing very nice. And, well, I don't know if, uh, if, if I have a clear strategy in mind in this. So I, I, I don't. I don't feel to be the right person, but uh, yes, I, I, I really, well, I think that uh, we need to be within and without the, the field, of course. So uh, in my case, I decide to uh, also to write in a journal, like for example, uh, Jacobi and the uh, to be part of the desk of Jacobi in order to decide what kind of uh, even if, uh, of course, you, you will not find a platform that is uh, uh, completely um, designed to your uh, purposes, but you need to reflect, uh, I think, uh, about the audience you can uh, reach through publishing in uh, some uh, journal or others. It does not mean that, well, of course, you can... Uh, You can put the same idea in different forms uh, according to different audience you want to reach. Uh, and uh, well, I don't know why you you want to leave me the floor, but it's, uh, because uh, because because of this, because for instance, this is something I have not done, like to be part uh, of the desk uh, of uh, uh, let's say a non-academic uh, journal uh, or even of academic uh, uh, journals. I have to say, I don't know if it's laziness or something else but uh, to be honest this is not something um i used to do and also uh for instance one thing that uh, i'm not very uh, skilled at for instance is uh, doing like uh, videos uh, or producing the kind of materials i mean i use pictures but uh, uh, i for instance uh, uh, we have a screen uh, uh, michele's uh, um, documentary I took with Loaya also in Metropolis because that was a, a very nice way of connecting struggles uh, from uh, different parts of uh, uh, Europe uh, in a way that was not uh, just uh, presenting a book, making a debate or making a public assembly. So uh, let's say a non-academic yet, let's say a bit more uh, traditional way of uh, communicating. Actually, as I said, um, the group that I'm part of is a bit peculiar in the sense uh, because it has always been a, a strong relation uh, with uh, um, activist uh, academics from different fields. Actually, the first experiment at uh, um, ethnographic research started very early in 2009 when I was uh, there uh, with a web documentary from which uh, the whole idea of the museum uh, then, uh, then started. Uh, and so uh, that started, uh, um, let's say, uh, a sort of snowball effect of different types uh, of research in that setting. So it started with uh, uh, visuals, then it evolved into arts, then it went back to writing, because at some point, for instance, there was the a necessity to um, again systematize and give a sense to all the art pieces and art experiments that had uh, that were in the place of metropolis so the, we decided okay we stop here and uh, we do a, a art catalog that we use as a book we publish it and then we move uh, uh, forward and uh, we found actually um, a small um, uh, publisher that was um, 
uh, be able to also to have a, a, a quicker, uh, let's say, review, uh, review process. Uh, it will take, let's say, from three to six months to publish uh, something uh, with them. It's a lighter process than uh, bigger uh, publishers. So uh, we uh, decided to go with that and make uh, some experiments at uh, collective publications. The first ones, uh, uh, again, were intended to be uh, art catalogs uh, containing pieces from uh, uh, activists, artists, uh, and people who were involved in the place. Uh, then we moved to, uh, then we organized this um, very strange moment. We organized a bus tour of how this was, where we invited journalists, academics, uh, and uh, uh, video makers and whatnot, we actually rented a 56 bus and we put them uh, in the city and then we asked these people to uh, write uh, uh, one chapter each of what became another book. And so uh, we kept moving forward with these um, experiments. Actually, I don't know if there was a proper strategy there. As I said, there was more of uh, a snowball effect. Uh, in a way, also finding a, a publisher that would accept to be, to be involved. Uh, of course, uh, it has, uh, uh, on the other way, uh, some, uh, um, let's say, limitations, for instance, in terms of distribution, of course, because uh, a publisher, for instance, cannot uh, actually print as many copies as, let's say, Pestrinelli or Franco Angeli would do, let's say, just to mention the Publisher, but on the other hand, you have the advantage of uh, uh, bypassing those uh, uh, very long processes that uh, uh, Michele was describing. One limitation that we have, for instance, I would think as an activist group is that we don't have a blog or a proper website to use uh, uh, social media. Uh, we have discussed a lot about opening a website, doing something more systematic, uh, but uh, yeah, we haven't managed to find our well, yes, but probably we should. <laughs> yeah. But Mom doesn't have a website? No, it okay. used to be a uh, no blog, uh, okay. something that has been a bit Well, thank you for your replies. If there are any other, someone? Wants to ask or share something else, or I show so, so, so yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, I just want to make this comment because of the because of the setting in which we are. We we learn a lot today. You know? So I if I if I remember when I was doing my PhD, we were picking stories of people postdocs or research. And they were achieving all these amazing things like reading blogs, reading books, being an activist. At the same time, the feeling from the point of view of people who are within your PhD can be both empowering, but also very disempowering at times. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Because you feel that you have to tick all these boxes. And, and that is definitely not the message that uh, they probably have offered that they have wanted to give us today. I think the idea is. Is to highlight again what they already said that this is a longitudinal process by which we start by doing something during the PhD and then we continue to have time. So some of the things that Margarita said have, have happened across many years, and some of the things that uh, I just I, I discussed with you have been developed as well. So it's important to say, you know, within the PhD, a PhD at the moment is very confined in which there are certain things that need to be done, and then we to start something that is engagement that we continue to do time. So you don't have to feel that necessarily you have to do it after three years. Okay. I was feeling overwhelmed you know, when I was thinking, oh, how do I do that? How do I do that? And it can be a very disempowering thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You have a question? I have, a, I have two quotes that I took from each of your presentations, and I want to try to use one quote to the other speaker. <laughs> so, uh, 
Margarita said, my positionality was my statement. That was a really powerful statement. So do you think that in your research, your positionality is your discipline? And then to Margarita Avidas, um, Carlotta said, the field sets the agenda. So <laughs> can you comment each other statements? Yeah, of course, uh, my positionality has been uh, the point uh, uh, from which I started uh, and my uh, the toolbox I have and so on and so forth with the good and the bad things uh, okay it means that uh, positionality means that if I'm positioned in one point uh, I'm not positioned in the other so it's always a partial perspective so I well, I agree with Margarita of course uh, uh, thinking about positionality as a limits and possibility at the same time, of course, because uh, we, but as you want, as you want me, you know, we are, uh, we are always uh, limited, but uh, the challenge is to make a step further in the analysis, starting from uh, your positionality. And uh, also in my case, I think uh, I, I always try to make uh, of the position I, I had in the field the, the starting point, uh, but not the ending point. I don't know how I, I think so. It's a, a way to start, but not uh, the field as a way to uh, justify my positionality <laughs> in a kind of sense. Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, I can distinctly remember, I don't know if I'm meant to send you right now, but discussing this kind of issue the first time I met Carlotta in a in bar when we were discussing uh, uh, how to start how, how to start the research. I came to Chirac some months up, uh, after the event. So we were discussing exactly uh, this thing. And at the point when uh, I met her for the first time, uh, the field had actually not only set my agenda, it had changed my research topic because as I briefly mentioned, I started uh, thinking that I wanted to explore migrant squatting, that was the point. Then when I went to live in the Aoni squat, I realized that yes, there was obviously a very important component uh, uh, about uh, mobility, migration policies and whatnot, but uh, it was not the only thing, it was related to housing as part of social reproduction in the city and so uh, using housing as a way of confining settlement and so mobility uh, as well. So I realized that uh, uh, using, if I maintained the, the initial research questions I had, I would have uh, forced uh, what I was observing into a box that uh, was too small for it. So, I called my supervisors very worried and say, oh, I am afraid I have to change everything. First question, will I have to do all the research ethics approval once again? And you're like, no, 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 don't, don't worry. That's, that part is over. So yes, not only the quick set, uh, it set my agenda, like, changed like the whole uh, project. So yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that we can close it. And yeah, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you to our speakers. Thank, thank you, thank Miguel, you. for the comments. Thank, thank you for joining us. And yeah, um, I guess we will meet again in the distant talks cycles, maybe, that we'll organize for the next, uh, well, academic year. And yeah, that's it. Thank you and ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye.